Today, we present a remarkable building that is consequential to the history of New Jersey. This house, built in 1758, is one of the oldest buildings in the Garden State. Known as the Friends Meeting House, the Quakers used it as a place of worship as well as a place to bury their people. In this short documentary, we'll take a look at its historical, cultural, and archaeological significance, as well as the project to restore its property. This program is designed to be educational and entertaining to the Morris County community and hopefully the state of New Jersey. We will show you the historical significance of the Friends Meeting House located in Randolph, New Jersey. This will be executed through interviews with anyone currently associated with the recent restoration of the building, anyone who has connections to the history of the property, and even ordinary town folk who live nearby and have their own stories to tell. The Friends Meeting House has been around since 1758. It has seen numerous wars, encountered countless rebuilds, and carries with it a deep history of a forward-thinking community. The society is embedded with the ideas of early anti-slavery thinking, a reoccurring philosophy and pacifism during the revolutionary and civil wars, and even has roots in the foundation of the town of Randolph. With the help of doctors Margaret and Nicholas Stenick and several other people involved in the Meeting House today, we will get the chance to look at archival photographs, documents, and maps dating back to 1890 as we take a deep dive into the rich history of this iconic landmark. I think in a lot of ways, progressives are generally considered to be, or Quakers rather, are considered to be very, very progressive people. And I, they offer us a different glimpse of American history than too often what textbooks show us. And uh, it's, a, it's an important story. It's in a very, very important part of how our country developed. But certainly their abandonment of slavery and how they practice commerce and trade um, are unique and they're important. And, and I think by all standards would be considered very progressive as well. Well, I think the historical significance of it essentially is that it tells a very, very important um, story and it's a, a really key part of American history. So if you're in Morris County, I think people are probably most aware of um, George Washington and um, you, know, you, you can visit uh, Washington's headquarters and so forth in Morristown, which is fabulous and exciting in itself. But the, the Quaker story here is critically important to really understanding the development of early American history. Uh, the colonial period, the revolutionary period, and so forth. So it's it's just chock full of uh, uh, really remarkable things to learn and uh, to build on. It had a huge impact on the development of um, not only Randolph Township, but this region of New Jersey. I think a lot of people are unaware that Randolph uh, himself was a Quaker. And so how Randolph Township developed is really, really directly related to the Quakers who were here at one time. So, you know, people live and we work in this town and so forth. We may not be directly aware of it, but we're really living with the impact of what they built. So uh, uh, for use as a place of worship and place of meeting for the men of Randolph Friends, the last year of use would have been 1865. However, after that time, uh, we know that the meeting house was periodically used uh, for different purposes. So uh, the, the Randolph meeting is part of New York yearly meeting. And we know that New York yearly meeting held meetings in the meeting house once a year uh, in the early 20th century. So it's been used off and on since 1865 for periodic meetings. Uh, but the last time it was used by the original Friends meeting was in 1865. A new meeting would start to meet there in the 1950s, and that meeting is still meeting in the meeting house. We have to do a bit of conjecture here because we don't have any formal documents that say so-and-so was responsible for building the meeting house. What we know is the following. We know that the meeting house had to be approved by the monthly meeting 
The month remaining at that time was in Woodbridge, New Jersey. And in, 18, in 1758, the Woodbridge Monthly Meeting approved the construction of the meeting house. When they, constru when they approved the construction of it, they uh, set up a committee. So the planning was done by a three member committee who came back to Woodbridge and said, we think the meeting house should be such and such a size, 24, roughly 24 feet by 24 feet. Uh, we think it should be built at a cost of approximately 78 pounds. Uh, and we recommend going ahead. So at that point, uh, they started to raise the money to do it. Uh, the money was raised by subscription. Uh, the head of the subscription committee was Henry Brotherton, who was one of the three members of the committee. Uh, the uh, other, one of the other members of the committee was uh, Preacher Vale. And Preacher Vale uh, had built other meeting houses uh, in the area. Uh, he was responsible for the Lane Mill Meeting House, and he worked with other meeting houses. So we're reasonably sure that the construction would have been overseen by Preacher Vale from Plainfield, uh, our Woodbridge area. Uh, but we don't know, as a matter of fact, and it's more than likely that the rest of the members of the meeting also kicked in felding the trees uh, and constructing the meeting house. The Friends Meeting House was built in 1758 and was later added to the National Registry of Historic Places in 1973. The Meeting House was central to the Quakers' way of life. This is where they came together to worship. The Quakers are known for being devout pacifists who were against war. They believed in religious freedom, good relationships with the Native Americans, and equal inclusion of women within their society. For the first 22 years, the Friends Meeting House was a place where the Quakers gathered every Sunday and Thursday at 11 a.m. for a meeting. Ever since then, individuals have gotten together in this plain and unpretentious place to meet and exchange ideas. The Quakers' mission is to inform the public about who they are to help preserve their history. Who are the Quakers? Quakers are a religious group. They started in England, were uh, uh, what were called a dissenting group in England, which meant that they didn't agree with the state religion. Uh, and as a result, they looked for a place where they would be more free to uh, practice religion as they wanted to practice it. This landmark provides us with an amazing understanding of the cultural world that existed back in the past and then how that has informed where we are today and how we have come together as a community. It also provides us with a nice foundation for understanding of what we need to do to continue strengthening our communities for the future. It, they were, it was quite evident who they were, and none of that is necessary now. You know, we're a multi-religious society. Presumably, people are not being hounded for their beliefs the way the Quakers were, so there's no need to do that sort of thing. It's, it's, it's an entirely different environment, different behaviors, different needs. So, yeah, substantially different. If, if you had walked down the streets of Philadelphia in 1715, you could have easily picked out a Quaker just by the way they were dressed. I defy you to do that these days. Um, Pennsylvania was founded by Quakers. William Penn was a Quaker. He brought a lot of Quakers over so that they were in, involved in the settling of the original 13 colonies. And um, Quakers have taken a serious part in, uh, in, the, in the politics, sort of, of the country. They were among the original abolitionists, and several of the women who founded the women's movement in the 19th century were Quakers, partly because Quakers always treated women equally with men. And so they thought, well, if they do it in church, why should they do it? Why can't they do it outside in the, in the regular society? Quakerism like all religions, revolves, evolves over time. 
So some of the beliefs are different today. So for example, Quakers will put up uh, markers on graves today. They weren't allowed to put up markers on graves in the 18th century. Uh, but the pacifism, uh, be not be belief that war is wrong, fighting is wrong, gambling is wrong, swearing is wrong, those sorts of things are probably still fairly consistent across Quakers today. I know that a group of Quakers had settled in this area. And um, they, I'm not exactly sure, I don't know all the history, but they either came up from Philadelphia, possibly along the Delaware River. Um, that's a good possibility because they were closely connected with a meeting house that is in Warren, it was in Warren County. Um, so that's probably it. Or they could have come over from New York City because there were Quakers in New York City as well. And once they got here, they started a community um, they were very active. They, they were, many of them were millers because there's right across Route 10 is Millbrook. And so there were many of them that were millers on the mill on Millbrook. And they were a serious part of the community. And in the 19, 18th century, uh, one of the members was Hartshorn Fitz Randolph, for whom Randolph Township is named. So when the Quakers settled in America, uh, they settled around the Philadelphia area, and they settled um, um, in what was called at the time West Jersey, uh, the area where you're sitting right now, where you're going to school, that was East Jersey. So New Jersey was divided into East and West. Uh, the East uh, was, uh, had its headquarters in, in Amboy, the West in Trenton and Burlington, that area. Uh, so. The Quakers initially were in South Jersey or West Jersey and the Philadelphia area. They were looking for new areas to settle and the North part of New Jersey or East Jersey was very unsettled at that time. So the Quakers are among the first pioneers to open up the area of uh, what we now call North Jersey, Morris County, Sussex County, Warren County, the Quakers were among the first to move into that area and settle it. They were among the most important settlers in that area. Quakers believe, uh, believed and still believe in that each person contains something within himself that can speak to God. And as a result, we are a group of people who believe in individuality um, and believe in equality and um, believe in the rights of everyone. Everything we have just seen gives us an idea of what the culture was like at the Friends Meeting House. We have presented information about the culture of the Quakers and the role that the Friends Meeting House has played in the perpetuation of culture. The fact that the Friends Meeting House is on the National Registry of Historic Places is remarkable because it gives people the opportunity to learn about a fascinating piece of history. In this historic burial ground of the Quaker Friends Meeting House, there are over 300 unmarked graves. The Quaker burial practices were practical and simple compared to the burial practices today. The cemetery and meeting house were established by pioneer settlers of Northern Mendham Township in 1758. These settlers, who identified as Quakers, maintained the burial ground until 1860. The responsibilities of the property were then assumed by the Brotherton and Vale families. The Friends Meeting House and Cemetery was then added to the National Registry of Historic Places in 1973. Today, a ground penetrating radar study has identified and mapped out numerous possible unknown burials. This ground penetrating radar study, as well as an upcoming archaeological dig, will shed light on the people who have been buried here. Let's look deep into the ground to discover this cemetery's history. Cemeteries teach us a lot about communities. Um, they teach us values that people have. Um, they teach us um, how we think about our own past. Uh, in the case of the cemetery over at the Friends Meeting House, it's really interesting because at a certain point, different points of history, 
Um, the Quakers um, would put some kind of a marker out identifying who might be buried there. And other points they did not. So there's a number of individuals who are buried in the cemetery um, who people don't, they're not entirely sure who they are, who they might be. Margaret Stenick, as well as Nick Stenick, who is currently the president of the Friends Meeting House and Cemetery Association, have both devoted much of their time to improving the site. One of the uh, things that we have to do, uh, one of our high priority projects at the Friends Meeting House is parking. Uh, we have no parking in the area. Uh, there is really no place to park on the street. And we therefore probably have to put the parking on the Meeting House. And as we thought about that, we know that the property is a cemetery and we know that there are a lot of unmarked graves on the property, but we don't know how many unmarked graves there are on the property. So in planning for parking, uh, one of the first things we did is uh, what's called the ground penetrating radar survey. On January 28th of 2020, a high resolution ground penetrating radar study was conducted on the Randolph Friends Meeting House Cemetery. The primary goal was to detect and map both the marked and unmarked graves on the burial site in advance to future proposed site improvements. The research was led by Tim J. Horsley through the Hunter Research Group. Ground penetrating radar is a method that sends pulses of electromagnetic energy into the ground. Uh, they travel through the ground and they speed up or slow down depending on soil variations, things like moisture variations. Uh, and when there is a change in the, the speed, the velocity of the energy, we get a reflection back that bounces back to the instrument. The instrument itself has both a transmitter and a detector. So we can record those reflections and we know how long it's taken from the pulse being sent out to returning to the detector. And that time it takes is related to the depth. So that way we can build up this three-dimensional picture. And to do that across an area, we have to walk up transects up and down across the area, much like mowing the lawn. So it's a very slow, tedious approach, but it, it's very effective and produces some very high resolution images of the subsurface. Archaeology is our way of understanding the past through the material remains that get left behind. But what makes the Friends Meeting House archaeologically significant? Another reason that we were so astonished is that we had a GPR survey done when the technology first became available 20 years ago. And at that time, they identified two possible burials that were not marked. So when suddenly you see this 200, we, we really were just uh, extremely surprised by that. That was not expected. Ultimately, to, only under, to, to fully understand what's going on, you have to excavate, you have to dig to see really what's there and to get dating evidence to find out who was there, the who, the when, and the, the why. We've prepared a, um, a scope of work that will be approved by the New Jersey Historic Preservation Office. And it includes uh, excavating three somewhat large areas. We should be able to find the grave shafts pretty easily once we remove the, um, the topsoil and expose these subsoils. At that point, we're going to pick several of the grave shafts and we're gonna dig down into them just enough to see if there are human remains. We will not be removing any human remains. Uh, we are gonna document them in place and uh, do some analysis of the human remains in place. We'll also be uh, trying to establish the, the elevation uh, at which the graves are buried, so relative to the ground surface. Um, if the graves are, if the uh, remains are deeply buried, there are less chance for them to be impacted by the proposed parking lot. If they're shallow or if there are several graves stacked on top of one another or burials stacked on top of one another, um, we may have to look at other ways of doing the parking lot that, that'll avoid impacting the burials. Having the opportunity to kind of enlarge that space so more people can come visit, especially our younger generation, because they need to know about the past in order to really appreciate the future and where we are today, then we are preventing people from really getting that, that really good understanding. So um, I know it's a little controversial um, because there are people laid to rest there and hopefully we'll be able to figure out a way to still continue to protect them. But we have to open up places like this uh, to the greater community so we can be better educated um, about what's, what happened in the past, why we are here today, 
and think about where we need to go for the future. It's a common theme that you hear from me constantly. What really drove us in seriously considering putting parking on site is that we had to stop the school tours and Quaker Avenue got so busy that the school bus drivers were no longer comfortable letting off those fourth graders. And now it's going to be second graders. They, they simply got too uncomfortable letting them off in the street because you can't pull off and going through that pedestrian access way. And that's when we, we finally realized we've got to tackle this problem. Since it was built in 1758, the Friends Meeting House has undergone many repairs that have led to the way it is today. Although it has gone through many interior and exterior restorations, this meeting house still stands strong on the grounds of Randolph, New Jersey. An estimated $1 million will be invested in a project to update the building and the landscape to solve various problems. When I took over in 2016 or 17, we realized that we now had to refine that preservation process. So we at that point commissioned a new preservation survey uh, and that was finished in 2019. And that said that these are the things you now need to do to take what was a stabilized building to a building that is truly um, a place where people can come in and visit to get it ready really as a site that is open to the public. And the steps that we had to go through were, number one, put a new roof on because it was now 40 years after the first roof had been put on. There needed to be a lot of exterior work done on the uh, siding to assure that it was stable. So that was number two. We needed parking and to do a lot of things in the cemetery to upgrade the cemetery. Uh, including fix some of the markers. So stage three was to deal with the exterior, the cemetery and the grounds. And then number four was to deal with some interior problems, uh, which were um, how do we preserve the wood? How do we improve the lighting? How do we deal with heating? And a variety of things. So we have step four is to deal with the interior. And then step five is there really is no visitor center for this building. So it's not a good place to get large groups in and other things like that. So the final step will be to create a, a visitor center, which will be a place with better restroom facilities, better kitchen, better meeting space where we can give an introduction before taking people into the meeting house. From the roof to the graveyard, this will be one of the most interesting restoration projects in Randolph history. With the help of doctors Margaret and Nicholas Stenick, as well as several others involved in the project, we will learn what it takes to restore this historical landmark. So preserving an old building like this is difficult. It is time consuming. You have to think a great deal about it. You have to watch what you're doing every step of the way. And that is expensive. But just looking at every possibility, thinking about all the needs, making sure we got it right, and with the least possible intrusion into the meeting house. If you ripped up the floor of the meeting house, you would find that it's filled with heating ducts and electrical work and safety work. Everything goes into the annex, so you don't see it in the meeting house. All you'll see for the heat are two registers, and they are inconspicuous. That's why it takes so much time and often takes a lot of money. We work with a specialist preservation architect, with a specialist preservation contractor, so they know what they're doing and are very sensitive to the needs of this old building. You have to be careful about the wood that you use, how you mill it. Everything goes into consideration when you're working on a building like this. If you visit the Friends Meeting House, you will see construction going on as they prepare for more extensive projects. The money invested will help preserve this building for the foreseeable future. The transformation should be astronomical for the better of the site.
So we, we've talked with the town, and it looks like the best solution right now is for us to do an entry and an exit portion in that west wall over there so that you turn the corner, you go a safe distance in, and then you turn in through the wall and move into our parking lot so that a bus can then stop and let school children off and then move on and park while the school children are there. Or we will have probably about 12 to 14 parking spaces there. I think it is critically important that historical landmarks like the Friends Meeting House in Randolph, very, very important for our community so that we know what existed in the past, what we have built on for the present, and what we need to continue to develop for the future. We do believe that preserving the past is important. I mean, that isn't what historians do. We study the past, but we're also preservationists. And um, that dual interest to us keeps us very interested in preserving this building. And one big reason to me is that I have been there when those Randolph school children come in. I've seen the looks on their faces when they walk into a building that is essentially a time warp from the past. The question is, how do you make that real to someone? How do you, how do you go from a book to pictures that you see to something that is actually real? And how do you show that there is diversity within that history as well? So that building actually brings to life what was going on 250 years ago in a way that it's very hard to do if just reading it in books and looking at pictures and so on and so forth. So we, you know, we both feel that as you can preserve these pieces of the past, and preservation now means 50 years ago, 30 years ago, I mean, we're preserving things now that for they're older, they're not as old as we are as historians at this point of reserve. But it's the only way you can really get a handle on what went into the past. You know, how do you actually make American history real? And that's what we think is so important about preservation. Dr. Stenick is working hard to oversee the project to make sure everything goes according to plan. When this process is over, more visitors will be able to travel and park there safely. According to Dr. Stenick, the restoration process could take up to five years with all the projects planned. The restoration process will help people understand the importance of preserving historical buildings like the Friends Meeting House. In this informative documentary, we learned about the historical, cultural, and archaeological facets that formulate the Friends Meeting House. We also revealed the plans to restore its 200-year-old roof and surrounding property put forth by the Friends Meeting House and Cemetery Association. Please go to RandolphMeetingHouse.org where you will find a place to donate and more information on this historical place.